this was on crimes of the powerful, and I uh, was a pro excuse me, co prosecutor uh, for the Permanent People's Tribunal, which took place in Bremen in December last year. The PPT, as it's known, found Sri Lanka guilty of structural and ongoing genocide against Tamils. It also found the United States and the United Kingdom uh, guilty of complicity with the ongoing genocide against Tamils. The press conference has been uh, called to discuss the proposed resolution at the 25th session under the terms of solution or problem. Now, if the aim is to normalize the military occupation, to normalize a situation where national self-determination for Elam Tamils is permanently denied, then in my belief, the US and UK proposal is part of the solution. But it's part of a final solution that would completely destroy the political legitimacy of the cause of Tamil Elam. The importance of the Permanent People Tribunal's judgment is that it establishes a well-informed third opinion in the international public community that is quite distinct from the policies being pursued by both of the two blocks of governments represented at the UNHRC. Alongside the verdict of genocide, the tribunal highlighted the extent of United States and UK complicity in that genocide. It's a vital point, given the current role and the current debate about the role of the two major Western powers. So my question would be, not only can Tamils uh, trust the Sri Lankan state and government, for which I think the answer is very clear, what we are discussing is can Elam Tamils trust the United Kingdom and the United States? I want to highlight today the deep and strategic military commitment of the United Kingdom, that's my country, to the Sri Lankan states and its genocidal policies. British complicity with Ceylon and then Sri Lanka after 1948 is rooted in an imperial strategy and the twofold aspect of the island's position as a counterweight to radical nationalism in, in India and the subcontinent, and above all, for the British, its critical location and its naval capacity in controlling the sea lanes of the Indian Ocean. Tamils may not sit on oil, but they sit in an ocean across which oil is transported. The spigot of the world's oil in the Middle East passes by the island of Ceylon or Sri Lanka. And this has been known throughout the 20th century by the British to cite but one example. Winston Churchill remarked about the battle which the British fought to keep the Japanese out of Ceylon, that this was probably one of the decisive battles of the Second World War. Because had the Japanese won, this was back in 1942, they would have been able to connect up with the German forces in Egypt, and in other words, they would have been able to deny permanently access to the world's oil, even at that stage. So from the perspective of British interests, we are always needing to bear in mind location, location, location. It is about a strategic and imperial interest. That's what over-determines how the British see the internal situation. And that's why they have always and consistently supported the Sri Lankan state as an as a instrument of repression internally to ensure external stability. For example, and this is a quote, I'm going to give you, um, the research we're now doing is uh, largely but not entirely based on documents that become available under the 30-year rule in British previously secret documents. In 1947, the three UK military chiefs, that's Army, Navy and Air Force, issued a briefing to the UK government in the, in the midst of negotiations about independence. And the three military chiefs urged the British government, Labour at the time, to make a commitment that it would, quote, introduce forces and take action 
as necessary to defend our interests. And the whole history up to and including 2009 has been within that same strategic pattern. There's been a programmatic involvement of the British military, secret service, top politicians, top civil servants, top police officers in training, equipping and directing the forces of the Sri Lankan state to eliminate through counterinsurgency strategies and methods any internal threats to the United States. If we take, for example, intelligence, this is operated at the very highest level. Uh, public doc now public documents show that uh, at least three times in the 1970s alone, the British intervened at the very highest level to support and provide intelligence to the Sri Lankan armed forces. If we move on to the 1980s, uh, in particular the role of special operations units, and there's a company which you may have heard of called Kini Mini Services, uh, which provided hands-on training to the Sri Lankan state to operate and kill Tamils. There is now published an autobiography of one person who calls himself Tim Smith, um, I'm not sure if that's his real name, who boasts that he was a helicopter hands-on uh, uh, trainer for the Sri Lankan Armed Forces in 1986. He says in his autobiography, within five months, he killed 152 Elam Tamils, and that's at the point at which he stopped counting. There were 35 such trainers, hands-on killers, of Kini Mini services in Sri Lanka, working with the Sri Lankan Armed Forces at that time. But obviously, the advantage to the British government of these special operations being privatised, it gives them some degree of deniability. But what the internal documents show is this is part of a deliberate strategy. The outsourcing was to, precisely to make a plausible argument of not being responsible. What is absolutely clear, and this is a point that uh, was raised in a long time ago, long before our research, by Sivaram, he pointed out uh, how consistently the UK state, and in particular the UK military, has been involved in training the upper echelons of the Sri Lankan military. This is not coincidental or contingent, this has been going on now for 50 years. Okay? Uh, for example, in the last generation, you will find, if you are care to look, that General John S. Field, uh, I beg your pardon, he was a colonel, uh, John S. Field, was the second in command of Sri Lankan Army Command and Staff College that trained the then Lieutenant Colonel Kamal Gunaratne in 1997-98. Those of you who know the situation in Sri Lanka will know that this same officer in the Sri Lankan Army became a general and was the commander of the 53rd Division of the Sri Lankan Army in 2009 and is attributed, and this is an allegation of a war crime, absolutely, against him, that he directed the killing of Elam Tamil prisoners, including journalist Isaya Priya and the LTT leader's son, Balachandran, 12-year-old boy. So what we have is a, the ultimate commander in the field, the killing fields, in May 2009, directly trained by the British. The UK government banned the LTTE in 2001, just as the Sri Lankan government was being obliged to de facto recognise parity with it in the negotiations that started in 2002. It was at that time, at that very time, that the United Kingdom began an intensive lobbying campaign to get the LTTE also banned in Europe, which succeeded, but not, later, not until 2006. So in other words, during the entire peace process, the UK was using its diplomatic effort in order to get the LTTE banned. And then also in this period, it was directly involved with the United States in a programmatic structural review of the Sri Lankan armed forces, which recommended the continuation of special operations against Tamil civilians, in other words, in the midst of peace, the British were directly involved in prosecuting further war against Elam Tamils. 
and this came right from the very top of the British state. In 2001, the United Kingdom set up a special security unit which was to directly advise the Sri Lankan military in a range of matters. And in 2007, once again, there was this uh, semi-privatization unit set up, this time called Libra, which was to concentrate on intelligence matters. There have been a series of training programs by senior members of the Scottish police, of the Northern Irish police, uh, of, to the Sri Lankan police, immediately before and indeed since the massacres of May 2009. The UK is not only directly involved in blocking international support for the Elam Tamil cause by uh, denying parity to the LTTE, it was involved in directly blocking every attempt to avert the human tragedy of May 2009. The UK's permanent representative at the United Nations, a man called Sir John Sawyers, who's, who was at that time the permanent representative to the UN, stopped any Security Council discussion about the crisis in Sri Lanka in February 2009. And this was the exact point, as we know very well from the Petri report, that the UN officers were raising massive alerts inside the organisation about the impending massacre. It was the UK that stopped the Security Council from discussing that report, that those reports openly. So it wasn't just an internal institutional failing of the UN, it was a deliberate policy of the UK government to, to uh, allow a discussion that may have averted the massacre. Sir John Sawyers has since his uh, appointment to, as UK representative of the UN, has since been subsequently appointed head of MI6, in, which is the, one of the two major intelligence institutions of my country. In conclusion, the UK government is trying to present the situation as post-conflict. Its strategy is to stall and give the Sri Lankan state time to normalise the military occupation of the north and east of the island. We are now in the phase of cover-up of the genocide. How can you hide a genocide in plain sight? We are not only witnessing a genocide as a social process, which is exactly the determination which the Brahman Tribunal came to, but genocide as a practice of international diplomacy. The current US and UK <coughs> position is a manoeuvre to delay and ultimately avoid a genuine international independent inquiry. In my opinion, in my view, public opinion should be demanding the immediate withdrawal of Sri Lankan troops from the military from the north and east of Sri Lanka and an inquiry into the genocide of Tamils that cannot include any of the major powers, the UK and the US, but also India and China that are in their different ways complicit with the genocide. Thank you.